anatomists and physiologists, this video series is about the endocrine system. And our first um, video in this series is part one. And we're going to talk today about hormones and what they do. For this whole lecture series, we do have a collection of goals. The first of which is to understand what the endocrine system does, why we need it, why it's important. We'll also talk about how our hormones structured, how they're released, and how they work. In future videos, we'll talk about the hypothalamus um, and how it it's part of the brain, but also the endocrine system. So we'll sort that part out. And then lastly, we'll talk about a bunch of endocrine glands, what they do, what they look like, all of the good things. So to get started, what exactly is the endocrine system? And the answer, I think the easiest answer would be, it's one of the control systems of our body. And I put these exclamation points in here because, like, isn't the nervous system the control system? Yes, but the endocrine system is a little bit too. Its mechanism of action is just different, where the nervous system uses nerves and electrical impulses to cause rapid changes. The endocrine system uses hormones. So cool. Hormones are little chemicals that act like messengers. So um, let's write this in our notes. It's a chemical messenger. So instead of the electrical impulse and a neurotransmitter as your message, as we see in nervous system, your hormone is the message. And the message is released by cells. It travels through the blood travels through the blood. That's an important part of how it moves around. And it's delivered to other cells in the body where it binds to receptors and causes a bunch of different possibilities. Intracellular responses. It causes changes. Causes changes. in targets. And those targets, of course, are cells. So these changes can be things about like changing the reproduction. It can be changing growth and development. It can be maintaining the blood contents. This is stuff like electrolytes. Water in the blood. Nutrients. Etc. It can also cause changes in cell metabolism. And closely related to that is energy. But also it can change how the body mobilizes to defend itself. So body defense. Mobilization. So all of these are just like changes. So that word changes, that's the important word here. So hormones are chemical messengers that cause changes in targets and they get there by traveling through the blood. But the idea that the nervous system and the endocrine systems are control systems makes it sound pretty similar, right? So let's take a look at some of those major differences. So this is table um, 16.1 in your textbook. This is comparing nervous system and endocrine systems and like how they work. So while the nervous system works really fast, um, the endocrine system does not. It works a lot slower. 
The thing about the nervous system is that, yes, it's fast, but those effects are also more short-lived. So in the endocrine system, the opposite is true. It works more slowly, but those results are more long-lived. Um, the hormones of the endocrine systems act in diffuse locations. So diffuse locations um, means that they can be delivered to anywhere in the body that blood goes to. But neurotransmitters, they act at really specific locations in the nervous system, like the neuromuscular junction of a motor neuron and a skeletal muscle fiber that we talked about in Bio430, by the way. Speaking of neurotransmitters, they don't travel far at all. Just across that synaptic cleft mostly where, where hormones, they travel long distances. They're released into the blood and delivered pretty much anywhere they need to go into the body. This figure from our text is showing you some of the major endocrine glands. And these glands are called endocrine glands because endocrine, that word endocrine, endocrine, it means secreting within. So they produce and release hormones and they put them into the surrounding tissue fluid. It gets picked up by the blood and taken around. The other types of glands that we've learned about maybe in Bio430, for example, they were not endocrine glands because they secrete stuff onto the outside, like sweat glands. They make sweat and then they, that sweat gets released to the outside of the body. So here's some major players that we'll be um, talking about in the next several slides and in the next videos in the series. Um, we have the thyroid. Um, let me get my highlighter here. The thyroid, parathyroid, hypothalamus, pituitary, all of these guys, adrenals, and even more. Um, but there's there's a lot of them. Something I think is interesting, though, is these guys I'm going to highlight or circle which are in the brain. So the pineal gland, the hypothalamus, the pituitary gland, those guys are all in the brain, but it's because they, bo they fall both within the nervous system and the endocrine system. So we can actually call the hypothalamus like a neuroendocrine organ. So the hypothalamus we can call a neuroendo organ, which means that it has both nervous system ties and endocrine system ties. So now that we've laid out like what, for, where hormones come from, we can start talking about what hormones look like. And we can classify the chemical structure of hormones based on its properties. And so there's two major classes here. Um, if that hormone is based in amino acids, we call it amino acid based. Amino acids are the little bits or the monomers that make up proteins. And these guys are usually soluble in water. So they're water soluble. If they're water soluble, um, because of that property, it's hard for amino acid based hormones to cross the plasma membrane. So water soluble can't cross plasma membrane. Because the plasma membrane of a cell is like fatty on the inside. So if you're not a fat, it's hard to get through that plasma membrane. So anyways, so amino acid based. And then the other um, category is steroid hormones. These guys come from the molecule cholesterol. And they're cool because they're lipid soluble. Lipid soluble. So something that's a lipid soluble means like it's like a fatty type of thing. And so that means that it can pass 
through the plasma membrane. Because that inner layer of the plasma membrane is the fatty thing, so it can get through that fatty layer. So our two structure options are water soluble, can't pass through the plasma membrane, amino acid based, or we're fat soluble, so we can pass through the plasma membrane. Those are two different flavors that we can have. So why does this matter? Amino acid based hormones have to act on the outside of cells. So thus they act on the outside of cells. because they can't get into the cell, right? Um, this is usually done by a bunch of molecules called G proteins. Well, I'll show you a picture of it, so don't worry about it yet. But it's just a bunch of steps that start on the outside of the cell that leads to a bunch of steps that happen on the inside of a cell. Steroid hormones, because they can pass through that plasma membrane, that means um, that they can act on receptors, act on receptors, on the inside of cells. And because they act inside of the cell, um, they normally have different effects. Um, and you all know me by now, I like to spoil endings. Um, they tend to either activate or inactivate genes, or activate genes. Okay, so that can be the structure, but what do hormones actually do? What hormones do is cha make changes in the target. It acts on the cell by binding its receptor for that particular hormone. Generally speaking, hormones change either by upregulating or downregulating activity in the target cell, but to say what actually changes, the answer is it depends. It depends on the cell type, it depends on what hormone it is, and so many other factors. But here's some possibilities. So we can change membrane permeability. Um, in a related note, we can also change membrane potential. that involves opening ion channels and stuff. We can cause changes in how an enzyme is made. Like we can increase it, for example, um, or other protein synthesis. Enzymes are proteins, um, but anyways, any other protein could work too. We could activate or deactivate. or deactivate enzymes. So we can shut them off or turn them on. We can cause stuff to be secreted. And we can also make mitosis happen. We can activate mitosis. These can, things can happen depending on how that hormone is structured. Those amino acid-based ones act through second messengers. So amino acid-based. They act through second messengers because they can't deliver the message to the inside of the cell directly. I remember amino acid-based um, hormones, they need to bind to a receptor on the outside of the cell in order for changes to happen inside of the cell. So it needs like a second messenger inside the cell to carry out its task. I'll show you an example of this in just a bit, but there's many, many ways that a second messenger can act. And it also depends on the target cell and it depends on the hormone.
Okay, um, steroid hormones, these are the fatty ones, which means they can pass through the plasma membrane. Thus, they can enter the cell directly and cause changes that way by activating genes. So this is steroid hormones. So they can activate genes after they bind to that receptor inside the cell. Remember that the stuff inside the cell nucleus is DNA. DNA is transcribed into mRNA, which is then made into a protein. And proteins, those are the things that do stuff in our cells. So by activating a gene through a series of steps will usually lead to synthesis of a particular protein. Okay, so let's jump into an ex that example I told you about, the second messengers. For hormones that can't cross the plasma membrane, so this example is talking about amino acid-based hormones. They bind a receptor on the outside of the cell. The thing to remember here is that when any molecule binds a protein, that causes what's called a conformational change in that protein's structure, which is just fancy science talk to mean that it changes its shape. When proteins change their shape, they work differently. Okay, so what's happening here is that we have a hormone. It's this little pink ball shaped thing that that's the first messenger so i'll highlight that the first messenger is the hormone that amino acid based hormone when something binds a protein like this receptor that's specific for that hormone that protein changes its shape so when this pink hormone binds this purple receptor that purple receptor a protein changes its shape So that receptor was bound to this little blue molecule. That little blue molecule is called a G protein. So that's why this is called like G protein. So when the purple molecule, this receptor changes its shape, it causes this blue guy G protein to change its shape and it becomes what we call activated. And how that happens is because of conformational changes, changes in shape. It kicks off this molecule called GDP, instead gets this high energy version of it called GTP. And this GTP is high energy, so that's what makes it be considered activated. Then this blue G, um, G protein with the GTP bound to it um, binds the pink one. That pink one is called adenylate cyclase, but it's pink, so we'll call it the pink one. So once something binds a protein, that protein changes its shape. So once the G protein binds the pink protein, that pink protein changes its shape, and that causes the formation of the second messenger. The second messenger is called cyclic AMP, or CAMP. Notice all of these colorful proteins are in the membrane. So, so all of these proteins are in the membrane, but CAMP, that second messenger, uh, I'll label that second messenger. And that CAMP, the second messenger, is the first thing that's fully, fully in the cell. CAMP ignites a series of steps that involve enzymes, and those enzymes are called protein kinases. Protein, oh, let me get a different color. They're called protein kinases. Um, enzymes that are a kinase, what they do is they take a molecule and they add phosphate groups to them. Um, and this is something that's, it happens a lot in biology that adding phosphate groups onto proteins can either activate it or inhibit it depending on like what protein or enzyme it is. 
But regardless, it's going to change the activity of that protein. Remember that proteins in the cell are usually enzymes, so this impacts the cell's chemical reactions. The cool thing about CAMP is that it can cause an ampli amplification effect because CAMP is really abundant in the cell once this pink protein starts churning it out. This means that you don't really need that much hormone so you don't need much first messenger to get a lot of second messenger. That's kind of super cool. Can we say exactly what effect CAMP has on the cell? No, because it depends on the target cell, on the hormone, um, and also some G proteins, depending on what hormone binds to what receptor, can also shut off this pink enzyme that makes CAMP. So that's also another layer. Anyways, that's second messengers. We have a first messenger, the hormone, a second messenger, camp. For example, there's other second messengers. Um, but the important thing is that this is for, this is the mechanism of action of amino acid-based hormones because they can't cross the membrane. The other example I want to talk to you about is for the activation of genes. And this is done um, by steroid hormones. So this one is gene activation. Remember that steroid hormones are fatty or lipid based, so they can pass through that membrane directly bind a receptor in the cell. And notice that there's like fewer and less complicated steps here. So basically what happens is that we, that steroid hormone enters the cell, we bind the receptor that's already in the cell, head into the nucleus. Inside the nucleus is DNA. We bind to a specific area of that DNA, make mRNA. mRNA then is the thing that makes proteins. Again, so series of steps. Steroid hormone comes in, eventually we're making a protein. We've covered so far what hormones do and how they can impact their targets, but we haven't really discussed what causes hormones to be released from endocrine glands in the first place. So that's what we'll do next. And this slide is just a reminder of where we can find endocrine glands in the body. So what stimulates an endocrine gland to release a hormone. Um, a stimulus is a science word for something that causes something else to happen. So in this case, there's three major types of stimuli that cause, ho cause hormones to be made and released from endocrine glands. The first is humoral. We keep coming back to that word humoral, referring to the body fluids. Body fluids. So this is some change in the body fluids that will lead to synthesis and release of hormones. Um, this example in this picture is showing you that parathyroid hormones, these little orange ones that are living in the larger thyroid, thyroid gland, that's this bigger one. But the parathyroids, if the concentration in the blood of calcium is low, calcium, blood calcium level is low, um, then the parathyroid glands, they secrete this hormone, PTH, parathyroid hormone. Um, and PTH acts on a bunch of stuff to help increase blood calcium, things like the bone tissues, etc. But there's tons of examples of this. We can monitor levels of glucose in the blood, sodium, potassium, so many more. These are all humoral stimuli that cause whatever endocrine gland to make and release whatever hormone to act on the target cells to fix whatever has been thrown off. So that is a humoral stimulus from the body fluids. The next one is a neural stimulus. This means that your neural signaling can lead to hormone release. So the example that we're seeing here is the activation of the SNS. So SNS activation. That can lead to um, stimulating the adrenal medulla, that's one of those endocrine glands, to release 
epinephrine and norepinephrine which has a bunch of effects on a bunch of different target cells. It's all the SNS stuff we know and love. Okay, lastly are hormonal stimuli. Hormonal stimuli, I kind of think of as kind of meta. It's like a hormone signaling for another hormone to be made and released. Stay with me here. The key here is that hormones are released from the hypothalamus in this example. So from the hypothalamus, we release hormones. The hypothalamus is this part of the brain, and then off of the hypothalamus, there's this like little dangly bit, and that dangly bit is called the pituitary gland. There's a front one and a back one. So we call the front part of the pituitary the anterior one, and then the posterior pituitary is the one in the back. But what we're talking about here is that the hypothalamic hormones, the ones that are made here, will act on the anterior pituitary hormones. And they'll act as like a regulatory thing to release or not release their hormones. But also, so the hypothalamus acts this way, but also the anterior pituitary hormones act on other endocrine organs. So the thyroid, the adrenal, and the gonads, for example. But then it also goes vice versa. It's all very, very regulated. So the fact that like hypothalamus talks to anterior pituitary and then we talk to all these other um, endocrine glands is something that helps make hormone release like this rhythmic or pattern-like thing of hormone levels in the blood. But wait, there's more. The nervous system comes in as a whole checks and balances thing. It can make really fine-tuned adjustments to maintain homeostasis way better than the endocrine system can on its own. So what the endocrine system might do slowly, um, the nervous system can help increase the rate at which it happens or increase the effects because we need to make sure all the body tissues have enough of whatever it is that we need. So the nervous system kind of is like trumping all, I guess. Receptors are specific. Hormones can bind to a target if and only if that target has a receptor for that specific hormone. But a hormone isn't, like we say it's a message, but it's not really a message. It's more like an on switch for a series of steps that lead to changes happening inside of the cell. So how much a hormone affects a cell though, really depends. It depends on if it can bind the target. Sure, yeah, the receptor's there. But if it can bind the target, it also depends on these three things. It depends on how much of that hormone is in the blood. It matters because if there's more hormone, then there's more effects. And then less hormone less effects, theoretically. But also it means that if you have more receptors, then there's more of a hormone that can bind and then, then you have more effects. But also if that hormone has a high affinity, affinity is like how well you can bind. So if that affinity is high, we say that's a really, really good bond. So that hormone and the R, uh, the receptor, they bind really well. So that also means that there's more effects. But targets, they don't stay the same all the time. Target cells can make more receptors if there's been like too low of that hormone around. So if that hormone starts to decrease its numbers, so here's my target. If the level of hormone was once high and now it's low, If we started with three receptors, our cell might be signaled to make a lot more to make sure that any hormone that's around has a very good opportunity to bind to any receptor that's local. The opposite is true too, if that um, hormone is too high for too long, we can start to get rid of those receptors because we're, there's enough to go around. This can happen 
to the receptor for that particular hormone, or it can happen as a result of the actions of another hormone. For example, hormone A can cause upregulation or an increase in receptors on a target cell for hormone B, which is a whole other layer. Speaking of whole, speaking of whole other layers, how do hormones actually interact with each other? In the last slide, we talked about that hormones can bind to the receptor and they can have an effect depending on a few stuff, like how many receptors there are. But hormones don't exist in a vacuum. Other hormones are around all the time and they can interact with each other. And how they interact at the target is, you guessed it, it depends. It totally depends. That interaction can fall under like three main categories. That interaction can be permissive. To be permissive means that that hormone on its own can't have its full effect without its other like hormone buddy. The example your textbook uses is the reproductive system hormones. They also need thyroid hormone for the proper timing of reproduction development. So they need their hormone buddy in order to have the proper effects. That, um, that interaction can also be synergistic. That means that hormone A can act the same as hormone B, but when they're both around, they increase their effects more so than if they were to work on their own. I kind of think of it like each hormone is like riling the other one up. And so they both just do more. The example in the book is the hormones glucagon and epinephrine. So example, glucagon and epinephrine. Both of these guys help the liver release glucose into the blood. But when they work together, releasing glucose into the blood happens way more. And then lastly, that um, action can be antagonistic. So to be antagonistic means like you're kind of giving somebody else a hard time. And so this is when hormone A works against the actions of hormone B. This can happen in a variety of ways, um, but they can act on the same receptors. They can use different metabolic pathways. They can decrease the amount of receptors for the other hormone. So it's really just like they're fighting each other for the actions. This is all I have for this video. Um, the next video in this series will dive into the various endocrine organs and glands and what they all do. I hope you have a great week.